from San Mateo. It's The Cube, covering Scalar Innovation Day. Brought to you by Scalar. Hello everyone, welcome to this special uh, on the ground innovation day. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here at Scalar's headquarters in San Mateo, California, the heart of Silicon Valley. We're here with the co-founder and CTO, Steven Sirwinski and Jeff Lowe, product marketing director. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Been a great day so far. Talked to uh, the other co-founders and team here. Great product opportunity. You guys have been around for a couple of years. Got a lot of customers. Uh, just newly minted funded Series A in, 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 in standard startup terms, that seems early, but you guys are far along. You guys have a unique architecture. What's so unique about the architecture? Well, thanks. There's really three elements of the architecture's design that I would highlight that differentiates us from our competitors. Three things that really set us apart. Uh, I think the biggest, the first one, is our use of a columnar database. Uh, this is what allows us to provide a really superior search experience, even though we're not using keyword indexing. It's purpose-built for this problem domain and just provides us with great performance and scale. The second thing I th would highlight would be the use of, uh, well, essentially we're a cloud-native uh, solution. We have been architected uh, in such a way that we can leverage the great advantage of the cloud, the scalability that cloud gives you, the, pl uh, the elasticity that cloud gives you. Um, and our s architecture was built from the grounds up to leverage that. Uh, and finally, I, I would point out the way that we do our uh, data, um, the way that we don't silo data by data type. Uh, essentially, any type of observability data, whether it's uh, logs or tracing or metrics, all that data comes into this great platform that we've written uh, that provides a, a really great uh, um, superior uh, query performance over. Yeah, we talked um, earlier about discoverability, but I want to just quickly ask you to, about the keyword mm -hmm. indexing in the cloud native. To me, that seems to be a, two big pieces because a lot of the older, well, current standards, people who were state of the art a few years ago, you know, 10 years ago, keyword indexing was a big part of it, and cloud native was just still emerging, except for those folks that were born in the cloud. So right. this is a dynamic. How important is that? Oh, it's, it's just critical. I mean, here, why don't we go to the whiteboard? I'd love so, to kind of talk about this in a little more detail. Right. In particular, so let's, let's talk about keyword indexing, right? Because you're right, this is a lot of the technology that people uh, leverage right now. It's what all of our competitors do. Uh, in keyword indexing, uh, let's, let's look at this from the point of view of a log ingestion pipeline. So in your first stage, you have your input, right? You've got your raw logs coming in. The first thing you do after that typically is parse. You're going to parse out whatever fields you want from your logs. Now all of our competitors, after they do that, they do an indexing step. Okay? This has a lot of expense to it. In fact, I'm going to dig into that. After the, the log content is, uh, is indexed, it's finally available for search, where it will be returned as a search result. Okay? This one little box, this little index box, actually has a lot of costs uh, associated with it. It uh, contributes to the bloat of storage, it contributes to the cost of the overall product. In fact, that's why a lot of our competitors charge you based on how much you're indexing, not even how much you're ingesting. Um, when you look at the cost for indexing, I think you can break it down into a few different categories. First of all, building the index. There are certain costs with just taking in this data, building the index and storing it, um, the computational storage, memory, everything, okay. But you build the index in order to get superior query performance, right? So that kind of tells you that you're going to have another uh, uh, cost. You're going to have an optimization cost. <laughs> Where the indexes that you're building are dependent on the queries that your users want to conduct, right? Because you're trying to make sure you get as good of query performance as possible. So you have to take a look at the queries that your users are performing, the types of logs that you're coming in, and you have to decide what indexing that you want to do, okay? And that cost is shouldered by the burden of the customers. Um, okay, but nothing's static in this world. So at some point, your logs are going to change. The type of logs you're ingesting is going to change. Maybe your query is going to um, uh, change. And so you have another category of costs, which is maintenance. Right? You're going to have to react to changes in your infrastructure. It's use the type of logs you're ingesting. And basically, this is just creates a whole big loop where 
you have to keep an eye on your performance. You have to be constantly optimizing, uh, maintaining, and just going around in the circle, right? And for us, we just thought that was ridiculous because all this cost is being borne by the customer. And so when we designed the system, we just wanted to get rid of that. That's the classic shark fin. You see a fin underneath is a great white, it's gonna eat you up, or iceberg, you see that tip, you don't see what's underneath. This seems to be the key problem because the trend is more data, mm -hmm. new data, microservices is gonna throw off new data types. So the That's data right. types is going up as well. That's is right. That, is that consistent with what you guys are seeing? That's consistent. I mean, what we hear from our customers is they want flexibility, right? These are customers that are building service-oriented, um, highly scalable um, uh, applications on top of new infrastructure. They're reacting to changes uh, everywhere. So they want to be able to not have to you know, optimize their queries. They're not going to want to maintain things. They just want a search product that works, that works over everything that they're ingesting. So good plan, you eliminate that flywheel of cost right. for the index, but you guys do a proprietary columnist, so that's the key on your end. That, that's the key that on That gives you end. flexibility on data types? Yes, it does. And here, let me draw a little something to kind of highlight that. Um, because, you know, of course, it's a, it begs the question, okay, we're not yeah. doing keyword indexing, what do you do? What we do actually is leverage decades of research and distribute systems on commoner databases. And um, I'll use an example in order to- And people know that in the database world, that's super fast. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a Ferrari, basically. Yes, it's a Ferrari, because you're able to do much more targeted, um, essentially, analysis on the, the data that you want to be searching over, right? And uh, one way to look at this is, uh, you know, let, let's take a look at a web access log. Okay, and, and when we think about this in tables, we think that each line in the table represents a particular entry from the access log, right? And your columns represent what fields you've extracted. So, for example, one of the fields you might extract is the HTTP status code. You know, was it um, a success or not, right? Or you might have the URI, or you might have the user agent of the incoming web request, okay? Now, if you're not using a common error uh, database approach to execute a query where you're trying to count the number of non-200s that you've, uh, your web server has uh, uh, responded with, you'd have to load in all the data for this table, right? And that's just, it's overkill. In a common error database, essentially what you do is you organize your data such that each column essentially is saved as a separate file. So if I'm doing a search where I just want to count the number of non-200s, I just have to read in these bytes and when your main bottleneck is sloshing bytes in and out of main uh, RAM, this just gives you orders of magnitude better performance. And we've just built this optimized engine that does essentially this at its core and does it really well, really fast, leveraging columnar database technology. So it lowers the overhead. Yes. You have to load the whole table in, that's gonna take time. Querying the table is gonna take time. That seems to be the update. That's exactly right. Awesome, right? Okay, cool. All right, Jeff. Yes, sir. So, you're the director of product marketing, so you got a genius pool of co-founders here at Scalar. Uh, been there, done that, all have successful track records uh, as tech entrepreneurs, not their first rodeo. Um, making it all work, getting it packaged for customers is the challenge that you guys have. You've been successful at it. What does it all mean? Yeah, it, uh, it essentially means helping them explore and discover their data a lot more effectively than they have been before. You know, with applications and infrastructure becoming much more complex, much more distributed, um, our engineering customers are finding it increasingly difficult to find answers. And so all of this technology that we've built is specifically designed to help them do that at much greater speed, much greater ease, uh, much more affordably, and at scale. We always like to say we're fast, easy, affordable at scale. You know, I noticed in, in, in getting to know you guys and, and interviewing people around, around the company, the tagline, built by engineers for engineers, is interesting. One, you guys are all super nerdy and geeky, so you get the tech <laughs> and you take pride in, in the tech and the code, but also your buyers are also engineers because they're dealing with cloud native, whole nother DevOps level of scale, mm -hmm. where they love scale. People in that market love infrastructure as code. This is kind of the ethos of that market. They, but, but speed scale is what they live for, and that's their yeah. competitive advantage in most cases. How do you hit that point there? What's the alignment with the customers on scale and speed? Yeah, you know, with the uh, couple of uh, things that Stephen had mentioned, you know, the columnar database, um, and he mentioned cloud native, we like to refer to that as massively parallel or true multi-tenancy in the cloud. 
Um, those two things give us really two key advantages when it comes to speed. So speed on ingest, that goes back to what uh, Stephen was talking about. With the column in our database, we're not having to wait to build the index, so we can ingest orders of magnitude faster than traditional solutions. So whereas a conventional solution might take minutes, even up to hours, to ingest large sets of data, we can literally do it in seconds, and so the data is available immediately for use and for search. Uh, one of our customers, in fact, uh, the one, one that I'm thinking of down in Australia, actually uses our live tail because it actually works, and as they push code out to production, they can actually monitor what happens and see if the changes are impacting anything positively or negatively. Yeah. And speed to truth is a tagline the marketing people came up with, which is cool. I love that um, kind of our philosophy, get the, get the content out there and get the, let the people decide. Yep. But in your business, ingestion's critical. Getting the ingestion to value time frame nailed down is table stakes. Um, people, the engineers, want to test stuff. And yeah. it doesn't work out of the box, but they ingest it and they don't see value they're not going to kind of maybe go to the next level. It's kind of a psychology of the, of the customer. Yeah, you know, when you're pushing code, um, you know, on an hourly basis, sometimes even minutes now, the last thing you want to do is wait for your data to analyze it, um, especially when a problem occurs. When a problem occurs and it's impacting a customer or impacting your overall business, um, you immediately go into firefighting mode and you just can't wait to have that data become available. So that speed to ingest becomes critical. You just don't want to wait. Uh, the other aspect on the speed uh, topic is speed to search. So we talked about the types of searches that our uh, columnar database affords us. Um, couple that with the massively parallel and, and true multi-tenancy approach basically means that you can do very, very uh, ad hoc searches extremely yeah. quickly. You don't have to build a keyword index. You don't actually have to even build a query or learn how to build queries um, and then run it and then wait for it and maybe in the meantime wait to get a coffee or something like that. I mean, we grew up in Google search. Yeah. Everyone who's exactly. who used the web knows what search is and, and discovery is kind of the industry word in discovery and navigation. But one of the things about search is about, that made Google say great was relevance. Mm -hmm. You guys seem to have that same ethos around data, discoverability, speed, and relevance. Talk about the relevance piece because I think that to me is what is everyone's trying to figure out as more data comes in, you mentioned some of the advantages, uh, Stephen, around you know, complexity around data types. You know, more data types are coming on, so relevancy is, is, is what everyone's chasing. Yeah, so one of the things that I think we are very good at is helping people discover what is relevant. There are solutions out there, in fact, there's a lot of solutions out there that will focus on summarizing data, letting you easily monitor um, with a set of metrics, or even trace a single transaction from point A to point B through a set of services. Those are great for telling you that there is a problem or that um, a problem exists maybe in this one service or this one server. Uh, but where we really shine is understanding why something has happened, why a problem has occurred. And the ability to explore and discover through your data um, yeah. is what helps us get to that relevancy. I remember meeting Larry and Sergey back in two, uh, 1998, and you know, they, from day one, it's find what you're looking for. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you know, they did their thing. So I want to just quickly uh, have you guys explain, because I think one thing that also has come up, and I'd love to get your take on it, guys, is uh, multi-tenancy. You're in the clouds, so you get a lot of scale, right. a lot of resource. Uh, talk about the why multi-tenancy is an important piece and what does that specifically mean for the customer vis-a-vis -vis potentially competitive solutions and what do you guys bring to the table? So that seems to be an important discussion point. Sure, no, and it is one of the key pieces of our architecture. I mean, when we talk about being designed for the cloud, this is a central part of that, right? When you look at our competitors, for the most part, a lot of them have taken existing open source off the shelf technologies and kind of taken that and shoved it into this, you know, uh, square uh, hole of, you know, let's run in the cloud, right? And so they're building these SaaS services where essentially they pretend like everyone's got access to a lot of resources, but under the covers, they're sitting there spinning up these open source solutions, instances for each of the customers. Each of these instances are only provisioned with enough RAM, CPU, for that customer's needs, right? And so heaven forbid you try to issue more queries than you normally do or try to use more you know, storage than you normally do because your, your instance will just be capped out, right? Um, and also, it's kind of inefficient in that when your users aren't issuing queries, those CPU and RAM resources are just sitting there idle, right? Instead, what we've done is we've built a system where we essentially have a big pool of resources. We have a big pool of CPU, a big pool of RAM, a big pool of disk. Everyone comes in, gets access to that. So it doesn't matter what customer you are, your queries get full access to all these CPUs that we have running around, 
right? And that's, that's the core of multi-tenancy, is that we're able to not provision for just one little, uh, for each individual customer, but we have a big pool of resources that everyone gets to love. And that's going to hit the availability question, yep. one, and it's also going to have a side effect for all those app developers who want to build AI and stuff, use data, and build these microservices systems. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the benefit because you have the, that closed loop or you know, the flywheel, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, if I could just add, the multi-tenancy really gives us a lot of economies of scale, both from you know, the over-provisioning and the, and the ability to really effectively use resources. Uh, but we also have the ability to pass those savings on to our customers. So there's that affordability piece that I think is extremely yeah. important to find the answers. This architecture affords that. Steve, I want to ask you, because you know, I know the DevOps world pretty well, and people are, they're hardcore, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they build their own stuff. Um, they don't want us to have a vendor, well, I can do this myself. This always comes up there, but this use cases here, you guys seem to be doing well in that, that environment. Again, engineering led solution, which I think gives you guys a great advantage. Mm -hmm. But what's the, how do you handle the objection when you hear someone say, well, I could do it. Well, I'm just going to do it myself. What I always like to point at is, yes, you can up to a degree, right? We often hear people that use open source technologies like Elk. They can get that running, and they can run it up to a certain scale, like a, you know tens of gigabytes per day of logs. They're fine, right? But with those technologies, once it goes above a, a certain scale, it just becomes a lot more difficult to run. It's one of those classic things. You know, getting 50% of the way there is easy. Getting 80% of the way there is a lot harder. Getting 100% is almost impossible, right? And you as whatever company that, that, that you're doing, whatever product you're building, do you really want to be spending your engineering resources pushing through that curve, getting to 80%, 100% of kind of a good, a great solution? No. Um, what we always pitch is like, look, we've already solved these problems, these hard problems for this problem domain. Come and leverage our technology. You don't have to spend your engineering capital on that. And then the people who are doing that scale that you guys provide, they want, they need those engineering resources yeah. somewhere else. So I have to ask you just basically the follow-up question, which is how does the customer know whether they have a non-scalable or scalable solution? Because some of these SaaS services are masquerading as scalable solutions. No, they are. I mean, we we actually encourage our customers when they're in the, the pre-sale stage to benchmark against us. We have uh, a, a customer right now that's sending us uh, terabytes of data per day as a trial just to show that we can meet the scale that they need. Um, we encourage those same customers to go off and ask the other competitors to do that. And, you know, it, the proof is in the pudding. And, it's looking, and how's the results? Looking good? Yeah. So bring on the ingest. That's, yes. That's the, that's the sales pitch. Yes. Guys, thanks so much for sharing the insights. Steven, appreciate it. Jeff, thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here for a special Innovation Day at Scalers headquarters in the heart of Silicon Valley, San Mateo, California. Thanks for watching.